Yeah. Um, well, I so I appreciate you sending me the um, the first uh, chapter. I wasn't able to get through all of it. Um, yeah, of course not. No, it's incredibly I... it's dense stuff. It's uh, it's I mean <laughs> it, it is English of academic philosophy. Uh, I know that. Yeah, yeah d- dense is an understatement, but very well written. Um, I thought. You know, it was uh, very complicated stuff, but the actual reading of it was a pleasure. Um, okay, glad, glad to hear that. There will one day, I, I hope, be a popular version of it that is 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 less dense and uh, less 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 aimed at my my my, my fellow philosophers uh, mm-hmm. um, and and more at the wider world. Uh, my dad likes to uh, likes to snort at the. At, at the stuff I write and says this book is the most impenetra- impenetrable he'd ever tried to read. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I guess that would be the common reaction. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess what this is a it's a trade book, but for a very specialized audience. Um, it's not really. I mean, it's, a, it's not even a trade book. It's an academic book. So okay. um, it's with an academic publisher, Oxford University Press. It's um, it's a it, it's a piece of straight philosophy. Um, it's maybe unusual in terms of being a piece of straight philosophy and that it engages with uh, physics, but tries to use it for philosophical purposes. Mm. So a lot of the times when philosophers think about physics, they are just like trying to understand the physics. And I do quite a lot of that in the book. I try and make sense of the many worlds interpretation, especially probability in the many worlds interpretation in a way that it hasn't always um, been made sense of before. Uh, but the the real target, the goal, is to make the many worlds interpretation do philosophical work. So hmm. bring uh, the resources of the many worlds theory to bear to answer philosophical questions. And if there are benefits um, in understanding the physics, then that's great. Uh, but um, the the real thought is that the physics has shown us so many uh radical interesting things philosophy hasn't really caught up in terms of our image of the the the, the lot reality in its largest aspects mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah i want to uh, i want to dive into the book but i think the first order of business might be to uh to introduce you to the audience um so uh for everyone listening it uh your name is is it alistair or alistair how do you pronounce it alistair alistair okay um, Alistair Wilson from uh, the University of Birmingham, where you are a professor at, and uh, before that you did your uh, bachelor's and your doctorate at Oxford, that's right? Yeah, no, I, I, I was at Oxford um, for, for several years. I was briefly in Australia, in Melbourne, at Monash University as a postdoc, and then uh, back to Oxford. They can't keep me away for long, but <laughs> these days I, I live here and I work in Birmingham. They're not, they're not too far away. It's a decent train. Okay. Okay. The whole lot of philosophy that goes on in Oxford, especially philosophy of physics. So it, it's a great place uh, to hang out uh, when I'm not one. <laughs> Definitely. Um, how did you? I'm just curious. Before we get into the book, um, what drove you to uh, to spend all of this time philosophizing? Well, it's the kind of thing you do with your friends as a teenager, mm-hmm. and I never really stopped. Uh, but I also I found out you could do it for a job, and. <laughs> Uh, that just seemed like too good to pass up, and uh, it's a, you know you need a lot of luck uh, to make it in any academic field, and philosophy definitely. So I, I had a lot of luck along the way, um, and you know you just kind of stay on the the horse until it throws you off, and it hasn't thrown me off yet. <laughs> well, uh, reading what of your work I have read, I hope it doesn't throw you off too soon, um, because because so far this has been a delight to read, and I, I, I look forward to the uh, the full book coming out, which is in March, right? Uh, it's it was February. This, this is this is the thing itself. Uh, let me oh, hold excellent! It right. Excellent. Uh, that's uh, the cover. You got some lightning striking a tree. Uh, it's a pretty contingent thing where the lightning's mm. going to strike. Um, <laughs> so the, the the idea is to a picture of contingency. Mm-hmm. on the cover mm-hmm. uh, yeah no it's, it's out now you can you, you can buy it if you like it is uh it is small but potent there's uh it's mm. not um it's not a big book but um there's a lot of ideas kind of packed in uh like kind of five a page definitely and, uh, it's not one to kind of flick through uh in in a few hours on the beach it's um <laughs> but, yes um, hopefully people like it yeah um, 
So I'm just curious, uh, did you work on um, this intersection between philosophy and physics in any of your previous uh, degrees, whether it was undergraduate or graduate? For sure. So I'm lucky, lucky to be able to do that all the way through. Uh, Oxford um, was one of the first places in the world, there's a few places that, that copied it uh, since, um, to introduce a joint degree in physics and philosophy. Oxford has this... Um, Kind of distinctive feature with its philosophy that you can't just study philosophy i don't know what i never quite sure what the reasoning behind that um i think maybe it, the thought is that like you get kind of too caught up um in pure abstract theorizing if you're just doing philosophy it's good to kind of have some like concrete substantial real world <laughs> knowledge to kind of throw in as well mm. so people do uh philosophy politics economics people do physics and philosophy maths and philosophy computer science and philosophy um with physiology and uh psychology those sorts of combinations and physics was always the one that kind of had my interest because what could be kind of bigger or more exciting than physics and finding out about like the biggest uh grandest features of the universe so i was always in at school into uh theoretical physics um you know reading about discoveries in astrophysics cosmology and in particle physics and I guess I thought I was going to be a physicist if I could be uh, when I grew up. Um, and I went to university to do physics physics and philosophy because I was always interested in the conceptual side of, of physics. And soon I found that like I was hitting my limit with the maths. Like um, uh, what I was always interested in were the conceptual questions about physics and uh, often to answer those best of all, you need to uh, like abstract away from some of the details of the math. You need to get it right, um, but you need to not become obsessed by it. Um, <laughs> and so what I became obsessed by instead was the, the metaphysics of it, the relationship between uh, what physics was telling us and philosophical accounts of the deepest nature of the world. And so I was able to do that, luckily enough, as an undergraduate. And I just kept on doing that stuff. This this project has has a long, uh, complicated history. But I was I was writing this in some form, even like in my second year as an undergraduate. And I just kind of kept adding to it and tweaking it. Um, and I wrote about it for an undergraduate thesis, for a master's thesis, for a doctoral thesis. I've written some papers on it, and I finally kind of put it all together into this book. <laughs> So, so it's safe to say you know a thing or two about this uh, this subject. Well, you might you might say I've kind of run into a dead end. and I don't know where, anywhere else to go. But uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I've certainly met most of the the kind of arguments against this sort of stuff that people give. So this project, yeah, has a long history, and uh, now it's finished. Um, and I pretty much haven't changed my mind at all in in the ways that matter about the, the basic idea. Uh, the basic idea that many worlds, uh, as it features in physics, can be used to answer philosophical questions and to give new mm. philosophical theories that we would never have kind of come up with without the cue that the physics gives us. Mm -hmm. uh, the direction of flow is definitely going kind of insights from physics into philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, it's much harder thing. It's a much harder thing to do to try to get insights out of philosophy into physics and kind of fix the physics. Um, because uh, basically, I, I want to say we know a lot about physics. We know an awful lot less about philosophy. <laughs> so the aim is to try and take something that we have, like a bit of a solid grip, a bit of a empirical basis for, and bring that to bear on philosophy, on the kind of questions in philosophy where people have usually just used their intuitions or common sense or pure reason, rational insight, uh, revelation, those sorts of things. Uh, to try and get answers to these questions. Those don't seem to me like great sources of evidence. Um, mm. You give a pretty plausible account of kind of where our intuitions came from. And it's not from like magical insight into the truth. It's from our evolutionary history and what's worked well in society for 10,000 years in kind of forming things that seem obvious. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't really trust those traditional philosophical sources of evidence very much. Um, I like the approach of metaphysics that sometimes gets called naturalistic, which is trying to answer metaphysical questions about the nature of reality, but in a way that connects up as directly as possible with the science. 
So the the sources of pushback that you said you you find are they in principle arguing against the ability of some sort of scientific realm to inform philosophy in general, or is it something about the uh, the Evredi and many worlds interpretation that they they object to? Well, there's there's, mm. there's a hundred different ways. <laughs> All of the above, yeah. And um, sometimes you feel like if everybody disagrees with you, but everyone disagrees with you for a different reason. <laughs> They can't make their mind up on what's wrong with it. Uh, that feels better than if everybody like immediately puts their finger on a, a particular problem. There you can worry that that is a, uh, a devastating objection. But if everybody dislikes it, but for a different reason, you haven't actually got any allies, but at least uh, you've kind of <laughs> something interesting that you're saying and people don't quite know how, how to react to it. There are a lot of philosophers around who want to kind of preserve the ability of philosophy to kind of be the sole source of knowledge on uh, philosophical questions. And by philosophy, they really mean a priori philosophy, that is kind of pure reason. Mm. Um, and so you get philosophers uh, uh, sometimes called rationalists that will want to say, uh, these questions can and should only be answered by reason, Science is in principle irrelevant to them. Empirical evidence is in principle irrelevant. There's no point looking at the world if you want to find out what possibility and contingency are. You just have to uh, think in the pure abstract about necessity and possibility and just kind of try and get some, some direct insight into it. I just don't think that kind of direct insight is available or that it's, it's reliable, that it works. Um, so I prefer a picture where what we're trying to do is to kind of fold in the knowledge we have from science into a coherent whole that also involves uh, specific answers to the philosophical questions. So you're kind of led by the science and the philosophy follows. The philosophy is kind of filling in the gaps and, uh, draw and enabling connections of the right kinds to be drawn between the relevant bits of science. Mm. So we've we've sort of hinted at it already, but um, uh, let's let's put it out there explicitly. Uh, so what do you think um, this interpretation of the many worlds theory can actually tell us um, that philosophy is unable to? Right. So philosophers have wondered a lot about uh, alternative possibilities. Alternative possibilities seem this very strange, peculiar, unfamiliar thing. I mean, we know what the actual world is like. It's kind of right here in front of us. We can touch stuff in it. We're part of it. We see other parts of it. We're right there. But what's an alternative possibility? It's kind of like the actual world. It's like it enough to be an alternative to it. There might be other alternative possibilities that are really similar to the actual world, that hardly differ at all, that just differ in some tiny way. But we normally think they don't exist. They're not there. So what are these, or, or at least if they are there, they're, they're in a very different way. They're like kind of shadows mm. of the real world. And so these kind of shadowy entities are really weird. Um, what are these alternative possibilities? What are they like? Where do they come from? How is it that uh, they have any relevance to what's going on right here, right now? And how do we draw the line between them? How come some things we can describe are impossible, square circles, uh, maybe accelerating faster than the speed of light, uh, a, an object with mass, um, and other things are possible. Uh, you know, getting getting out of bed a little bit earlier. Uh, <laughs> the, these things that we take could e we think could easily have happened, versus these things that we think just couldn't possibly have happened. What's the difference? How do we draw the line? Uh, what does uh, that difference really consist in? Um, and philosophers have tried to answer this question, but I think pretty much they've come up uh, blank. Um, it's really hard to give any account of what possibility, contingency. There's all these kind of family of notions. So possibility means it can happen. Necessity means it must happen. Mm. Uh, and then there's all the sorts of grades in between of probability, things that are more likely than others to happen. Mm -hmm. So it seems like we've kind of got a graded notion of, of, of possibility. We have absolute possibility. Um, we have absolute impossibility. And then of the things that are possible, they can be more or less probable. Mm -hmm. um, so there's quite a lot of structure there. And 
it's pretty unsatisfying to just say there's nothing more to say about it. There are these things, they're possible, that, that's the end of, end of the story, no more questions now. Um, and that's the line that philosophers tend to take. It's like, if the problem is too hard to give an account of possibility and necessity and contingency, this kind of idea that things could have been otherwise, um, in any independent terms, then we just give up. And philosophers sometimes say, we'll take it as primitive. We won't mm. try to explain it in terms of anything else. And I think that's a cop out, um, especially with something that plays as big a role in our lives as alternative possibilities. Given how big a role that like, we think about them all the time, we get obsessed by them, things that we could have done, should have done, uh, might still do. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's kind of occupies pretty much all of our planning, decision making and assessment of things we things we have done. Um, you know, if, if something if we couldn't have done any differently, then we don't regret something or don't regret it nearly as much. But mm. if we know we could easily have done different things and that would have led to a very different outcomes, that can be hugely important to us. Um, so I think there needs to be an account of what these things, alternative possibilities are, what, what contingency is, uh, which allows us to explain why it matters to us so much. And theories that kind of come up with abstract objects in some platonic heaven kind of floating up there like like numbers or shape <laughs> and it doesn't really cut it because there's no obvious reason why we should care about those things we should care about the stuff around us mm -hmm. and my approach to possibility makes alternative possibilities much more like the stuff around us they're more worlds just like ours just the same sort of thing, but other ones with other people in. And mm. so kind of, we're not alone. The actual world is just one of these worlds, but there are many others. Mm -hmm. And this one's only special because we're in it. And I think once you have a picture like that of these multiple worlds, which are equally real, and we find ourselves in one of them and not in any of the others, then you've got the start of a story about why it is that possibility should be so deeply relevant to our lives. Mm. Now, all of this, it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong or if you disagree, but it, it seems to assume some sort of metaphysical realism to all of this, right? Um, like there, there are these uh, objective universes and it's not some sort of, uh, you know, like relativistic or um, soft, sophistry painting of the world. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm unashamed to be a metaphysical realist <laughs> about this stuff. Like, I'm not, mm. you know, I don't want to be a realist about uh, every possible thing in the world. Like, um, you know, maybe I'm, I'm fairly skeptical about uh, kind of qualia or um, mm. kind of pure conscious experience separable in principle from matter. And uh, there are plenty of stuff, things that don't exist, like there's no unicorns, there's no dragons. Um, mm -hmm. uh, though maybe there's some dragon-like things in some possible world, but if they're there, they obey the laws of physics, uh, mm -hmm. at least the laws in that world. Um, so I'm not kind of like realist about everything you might imagine, mm -hmm. but I'm realist about the things you need in order to explain why we think like we do and how we do science in the way we do. Uh, and my thought is that there would just be no way of explaining this kind of incredibly complicated practice that we have of considering alternative possibilities what, and thinking what would have happened if mm -hmm. we acted differently, the so-called counterfactual conditionals. If mm -hmm. I had got up a little bit earlier today, I might have achieved a little bit more. <laughs> um, we constantly considering those sorts of things. And if there was just nothing in the world that corresponded to any of that, it would be a pretty deep mystery why it was so deeply ingrained. Mm. Uh, I mean, maybe you could make sense of it, uh, you know, like we do, we do sometimes make up stuff, like we make up fictions for entertainment. But this doesn't seem to be a fiction, or at least it doesn't seem to be uh, a good explanation of how deeply we care about alternative possibilities if they're all mere fictions. Um, so yeah, mm. so I'm, I'm, I tend to be realist about a lot of things. Uh, mm -hmm. And the, the general uh, argument for that is a, um, 
explaining our argument from explaining why we have the kind of practices that we do. Yeah. It's a little bit like the um, uh, argument from uh, for scientific realism from the success of science that says if uh, the science wasn't at least roughly getting the nature of the world right, it would be a complete mystery about how it was so successful. Yeah. In the same way, if our thought about alternative possibilities wasn't at least getting something right about the world, about reality, it would be a mystery why we engaged in it so successfully and why we take ourselves to be doing the right thing when we consider mm -hmm. alternative possibilities before we make our decisions. So, so the popular conception, and it's sort of, I guess, the lay understanding that I brought to this reading is of the... Um, the the popularized you know many worlds interpretation um and you know uh explain more of this if you could but from my understanding and i think this is what a lot of people coming into this conversation will will have is that there are um these multiple universes or multiple worlds um and each each world is very much its own entity um, but the expression of, of possibilities, like you said, is differentiated by which world you happen to find yourself in. So like you said, we happen to be in this world where I got out of bed 20 minutes late this morning. And in another world, I actually got up when my first alarm went off, not after the couple of snoozes. Um, and so I, I got up 20 minutes late because I happened to be in this world. Um, but there's a very real sense in which I could have been in the other world as well. Um, so yeah. the the thing that I'm I guess I'm curious about um from the lay conception of this is uh, what sort of relation do these worlds have to each other like are they sort of um neighbors that almost interact in a way or are they completely separable um and and I'm asking that I guess from the position of wondering how new worlds get defined um because it seems like there's a a hugely exponential um, you know, factor to this where I could have gotten up at any number of second intervals um, and all of those would become their own worlds that then would fractal into, you know, it just, just unimaginable numbers. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, worlds, uh, definitely like mm. the numbers here are incomprehensibly large. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, it's, it's actually, I think, an open question, a matter for physics and cosmology uh, still to decide uh, if the many worlds theory is right, how many worlds there are. Like, it could be an infinitely many. It could be that there's a finite number of worlds. They're just an extraordinarily large finite number. Mm. Um, and, yeah, co controversial physics, including kind of string theory, the holographic principle, um, uh, questions about the finitude of the universe in its spatial and tem temporal extent. These are these are all relevant, um, but I just think it's it's kind of striking that uh, assuming for a moment the many worlds theory is right, we still don't know whether there are infinitely or finitely many of them. Mm. But what we do know is that there's a lot of them, <laughs> um, and so this is this is kind of a curious thing about the many worlds interpretation. A lot of different people endorse it, but tend to have different approaches to what uh, the worlds are like and how they fit together in, in the kind of, so different answers to the question you're asking. Uh, so two, two different ways of understanding the worlds um, are as parallel worlds. Think of them as, as kind of streams, rivers that run alongside each other, mm. where you can't get from one into the other, but they're kind of nearby uh, in some sense. And some of them are kind of nearer by to others than, you know, uh, so, you know, some some rivers are very far away from others, but other ones are, are kind of quite close to ours. Um, and we're just in one of them. And that's all we ever see when we look around us. But what we see when we look around us and when especially when we look in detail and do quantum mechanical experiments is uh, phenomena which don't seem to make sense if our world is all there is, or at least we see phenomena that could be made sense of much more easily uh, if we bring the other worlds into the story. <laughs> so the way I think about it is as a, a big collection of parallel worlds, mm. a huge number of them, 
Um, but a number that doesn't change. So it's not like the words increase in number over time. There's always a lot of them. And they, hmm. some of them start out similar, but they end up being different. But that's a matter of like different worlds matching up to a certain time and then being different afterwards. It's not like there's one world up to a time which then that world splits in two. Mm-hmm. So you have one world earlier and then two worlds later. You just got two all along from the beginning. It's just they're like at the beginning and, diff- and unlike later. Can, so can I, I ask real quick? Sorry yeah. to interrupt. Divergence. Would that would that be um, like dependent upon somehow there being an initial number of streams that was mathematically predictive of the end possibilities? Yeah. So it would it would be the kind of the question about how many worlds there are is a is, is a holistic question. Hmm. It, you have to answer it by reference to the entirety of the quantum state. The entirety of the quantum state will fix. The number of worlds. There are further complications, which is that the worlds aren't, are, they're kind of a little fuzzy at the edges. There's not a kind of definite, precise number of them. There's different ways of counting that get you more or less. Same way if you look, look up in the sky on a, on a nice day when there's little white puffy clouds mm-hmm. and you try and count the clouds, it depends how you count what number you'll get, whether you count like mm-hmm. two nearby ones as the same as two or, or as one. And it's a little bit different with worlds, as you might expect. They're not exactly like clouds. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, there's kind of different ways of counting which uh, look equally legitimate and give you different numbers. Hmm. And that's one of the hardest things to get your head around. The fact that the number of worlds in this multiverse might be an indeterminate uh, thing in the same way that, that the number of clouds in the sky might be an indeterminate thing. But suppose you've, uh, you've, you've got your head around that. Yeah, the, the image is uh, of a big collection of parallel worlds. We're in one of them. They don't split. And in this respect, it's most like the approach to the many worlds interpretation that David Deutsch has defended. Um, and it's a bit unlike the, the, the approaches um, that uh, people like uh, Lev Weidman um, have defended, whereby you get genuine splitting. You get one world that splits into two. Um, Sean Carroll is, of course, a very well-known defender of the many worlds uh, interpretation these days. And he uses kind of both of those ways of thinking about it at different times, uh, depending on the kind of argument that he wants to make. And I would really like to uh, get a straight answer from him, uh, whether he thinks the worlds are splitting, so they increase in number, or parallel and just become different over time, or even whether there's a fact of the matter about that. David Wallace, uh, who's another influential author on the Many Worlds Interpretation, uh, takes the view that the question, are these worlds parallel or splitting? Does the number of worlds uh, stay the same over time or increase? Mm. He thinks that's not even a well-defined question. He thinks there's something, there's a kind of mistake in the very formulation of that question. Uh, And you'll have to ask him why he thinks that. It seems to me... Um, pretty clear that these worlds are either parallel streams or they are streams that split and yeah. there's got to be like an answer to that question he thinks somehow the question is meaningless and uh, so we've had long, uh, <laughs> long debates about that uh, in the past <laughs> um, but my, my picture is, is parallel streams you can't ever cross sad to say to other worlds um, and they fit together think of it like a jigsaw because it's not like these other worlds are irrelevant. They are part of the physics that explain why our world is as it is. So I'm thinking what's going on is that reality is like a cosmic jigsaw. That physics in full generality describes the whole jigsaw. But when, you, when you're just, us, all of us are located in just one of the pieces of the jigsaw. And so all we can know about the wider jigsaw is by inference to uh, what explains our world being the shape that it is. So a natural way to explain why our jigsaw piece is the shape that it is, is by reference to the nearby pieces around it that kind of create the right hole Mm. for our piece to fit into. You can explain why our piece is the shape that it is in terms of uh, the shape that it has to be in order to fit into the larger jigsaw puzzle. Mm. So it's like the rest of the world leave a hole, Mm -hmm. and so if there are all these other worlds um, in the way that physics seem to be describing, 
then they leave a hole which is shaped just like our world and that explains why our world is is the way that it is <laughs> so it's a it's a pretty t- it's a tough one to get the, your head around because i'm <laughs> saying that these uh these other worlds cause things in our world mm-hmm. i think causation happens just within a world so to to bring it back around to our original example i i might happen to be in the world in which i woke up precisely at the time i did because I mean, precisely because there are other worlds where I woke up at different times, and I have oh. to be in this one a- as yeah. well as the other it's version a, of me. It's different. It's a loose way of speaking on my mm. picture to say that you're in the other worlds. True, true. Strictly speaking, you're just <laughs> in your world, which is also my world. <laughs> yeah. So we're in yeah. this together, and all your listeners are also in the same world. <laughs> and the other worlds have people just mm. like you, just like me. They are people. <coughs> they're called Alistair, they're called Jordan. Mm. Um, but they are dif- distinct people with different bodies. Yes. Um, and they are thinking their thoughts. You're thinking your thoughts. There's no overlap between the thoughts or anything. Mm-hmm. These are just um, very, very closely resembling uh, situations. Mm. And then the idea is that even though, strictly speaking, these aren't versions of you. They're just very like you. Mm. <clears throat> Still, they count as alternative possibilities for us. So what it is for you to have been able to, uh, what it is for it to be the case that you could have got up a bit earlier is for there to be someone who is really like you in all the relevant respects who does get up a bit earlier. <laughs> and yeah. even though it's not you that's getting up earlier, still we can kind of learn a bit from knowing that there's someone just like you that got up a bit earlier. So kind of what it is for us to have possibly could have got up earlier is for there to be someone just like us who did. And knowing that there's someone just like us who did tells us stuff about the future. It tells us that, you know, there's hope for us tomorrow. <laughs> and, uh, um, mm-hmm. Because if that person just like you in the other world does get up earlier, then that's good evidence that you might get up earlier tomorrow. You've kind of got it in you because you have the same properties as someone who does. Yeah, yeah. This brings up <coughs> really interesting uh, questions about the the borders of sort of personal identity also. Um, because, you know, I guess yeah. the, the natural question that arises is how a like me does a, you know, not a copy of me, not a version, but just the similarity of me have to be like, for me to actually glean any relevant information from him. Um, yeah, and it's, I don't know where to draw that boundary. Yeah, well, I don't think you need to draw it sharply. Um, so one, so th- this, this would be to kind of flip back to kind of pure philosophy for a minute. Hmm. Um, but there's a lot of puzzles about identity. Uh, puzzles like the ship of Theseus, where you uh, replace a uh, ship plank by plank until all the planks have been changed. So none of the wood is the same as the wood that was making up the old ship. Have you got a new ship or have you just got a old ship with some updated planks? Um, There's a whole lot of of tricky questions here. Um, Questions about uh, statues and lumps. Um, The kind of thing that uh, you'll like uh, do in detail if uh, if you take a metaphysics class. Um, And... David Lewis, who is one of the people that inspired this, uh, this, this book, this idea, uh, had the idea that if you have uh, just all the alternative possibilities kind of out there in reality to use, there doesn't need to be a fact of the matter at what's the same or different. Instead, these alternative possibilities are just more or less similar to the actual world. So it can be vague. Uh, at what stage it stops being you. It's really a matter of what you count as similar enough. And that might vary from context to context. So it might be that kind of for purposes of thinking, I could have got up a bit earlier, um, uh, we're going to restrict attention to people who kind of have the same sort of psychology, brain physiology, and kind of life and lifestyle as we do. But if we are um, uh, thinking, you know, uh, 
I could have um, been hit by that bus on the way to work, then we might want to uh, allow lots of a, a broader set of, of possibilities in. Um, or Just trying to uh... or even more or even more restricted some possibilities um it like for for that one it almost depends more on geographical constraints um the fact that i happen to take that way home and not a different way but i mean okay so so, so let me let yeah so i think actually that was not a good example let me let me try and give a different example mm -hmm. um there's a line uh in a song by the Pogues and Kirsty McCall, uh, where they sing back to each other, uh, I could have been someone, well, so could anyone. And if uh, you're thinking, you know, I could have, um, I could have had a very different life, um, then you might be abstracting a long way from the actual facts about you. Mm. Um, there might be contexts in which you want to say, I could have been born to different parents. Uh, a lot of philosophers don't think that would be you. Mm -hmm. but I don't see why, uh, that that couldn't be you. Like, you know, if I was, I, I think it makes perfect sense to say, if I uh, was a wombat, I would eat grass. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, the, 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 the kind of possibilities for me that you have to think about, if you want to make, if you want to make sense of if I was a wombat, I would eat grass are situations where I'm a wombat and they're mm -hmm. pretty long way away. They're pretty physiologically different from me as I am now. And there's an interesting question. Like what are the possibilities that we're thinking about when we think if I was a wombat, I would eat grass. Are they possibilities where I like, I turned into a wombat 10 seconds ago by quantum fluctuation or are they worlds where I've always been a wombat and I was born a wombat. Um, they don't have to be definite answers to these questions uh, on this view. All that matters is there are people just like me, and then there are wombats that are rather less like me in these other possible worlds. Mm. And what we want to count as our counterparts or as things we could have been is a matter of what we want to count as relevantly similar for our purposes in thinking about them. And that's going to vary with our purposes. So the ontology is fixed. There is certain people out there, certain wombats out there, but how we think about them is flexible and uh, relative to our purposes. Um, and that's, that's the, the, the joy of, of David Lewis's counterpart theory. It lets us be flexible about uh, which things in which possible worlds count as possibilities for us. Mm. So is there any, is, I guess there's, almost no sense in which something is impossible then, right? Well, I mean, if it breaks the fundamental laws of physics, mm -hmm. for me, it's impossible. Mm -hmm. And this is actually one of the most controversial bits of the book because it's absolute dogma in philosophy and metaphysics questioned by really few people that the laws of physics themselves, even the fundamental laws, could have been different. Everybody in metaphysics pretty much presupposes that although the actual laws of physics might say energy is conserved, it could have been that energy was not conserved. Why do people think that? Really good question. Yeah. If you are, basically, it's because they can imagine it happening and they don't have any good reason to think that stuff they can imagine couldn't have happened. So things are kind of possible unless proven otherwise. Mm. Uh, you know, same, same, like kind of innocent unless proven guilty um, scenarios are possible unless proven impossible. That seems to be the way that people in philosophy think about scenarios. And Which is, it's weird to to put the in put it in that frame though, because how would you prove that it's impossible? Well, you might want to give some reason uh, mm. for its impossibility, and the classic one that like most philosophers would accept would be logical inconsistency. So if you can describe a scenario and then show that it's logically inconsistent, that like shows that it's impossible. People that have been impressed by reading Kripke, Saul Kripke, uh, might think that if it co contradicts facts about identities of things, then it's impossible. So I couldn't have been you. Uh, so the scenario in which I'm you is impossible for Kripke, and lots of other philosophers believe that. Water is actually H2O. 
So the scenario in which water is X, Y, Z is just impossible. If then the X, Y, Z, it's got to be something else. Mm. Um, so philosophers tend to think that logical inconsistency is enough to rule something out as impossible and contradicting the facts about identity, what is what, mm -hmm. which things are which, is enough to make you impossible. But not much else is. And in particular, contradicting the actual laws of physics isn't enough to make you impossible. Hmm. But on the picture that I like, uh, the laws of physics are the arbiter. The, the, the fundamental laws of physics are the arbiter of what's possible. So uh, something is possible if and only if it's permitted by the fundamental laws of physics. Um, and that means that what's possible becomes accessible to scientific investigation. Um, it's not just a matter of like sitting in our armchairs and thinking hard to work out what's possible and then finding out we disagree and we don't know what to say at that point. Um, we've got, uh, we've got a kind of in, in principle, empirically accessible arbiter of what's possible, impossible, what physics permits. And of course, um, the other sciences because they're kind of built on physics. The world is, is a fundamentally a physical world, but when the physical stuff patterns and behaves in certain ways, it is aptly describable by the higher level sciences. If biology says that something's possible, then uh, we know it's also physically possible. So anything that any of our sciences tell us is possible, we can be pretty confident that there's a quantum world where that's where that thing happens hmm. the that's world where so dinosaurs, interesting dinosaurs evolved intelligence biology tells us or <clears throat> arguably it tells us there's nothing in principle to stop dinosaurs having involved it intelligence mm -hmm. um, and so there's a world where they did and if it's not possible it should be biology that tells us that if maybe there's some like limit on the size of their brains that stops them processing enough information i think that would be kind of surprising but again mm. that would be a scientific discovery uh so all of the job of finding out what's possible and not gets handed over to science philosophy uh is really only addressing the question now of what it is to be possible not which things have that status mm. i'm i'm sort of being drawn to the um to the personal aspect of this, and I'm curious what you think about um, what it actually means, I guess, to, to think about possibility then in this case, where, you know, if I, I presumably I can't jump streams, right? Like I'm in the stream that I'm in. Um, and <sighs> if you take the interpretation that the streams don't split, there's no real sense in which I can ever affect which stream I'm ever in or, or what the well, shape of this stream is. Is that, is that slightly misguided? Well, I mean, that's one way of, of thinking about it. That would be, I think, a depressing way of thinking about it. Okay. okay. <laughs> but I don't think the situation is worse uh, than it already is with physics and free will. Mm. Because whatever theory of physics you give, it's a total mystery how free will of the kind that we think we have could exist there. In a deterministic theory... Uh, the current state of the world fixes everything that's going to happen. Looks like we haven't got any free will. If you add any randomness in, in quite like in determinism, it's not like we control that randomness. So it's not exactly. like that randomness gives us any extra control. So there's the, there are these really um, powerful looking arguments that seem to say whether the world is deterministic or indeterministic, there's no such thing as free will. Mm -hmm. So I've been kind of convinced, like a lot of philosophers have, by the so-called compatibilist response to that, that says actually free will and determinism, free will and indeterminism are compatible. Uh, and freedom is less about being able to be completely independent of any physical constraints. And instead, it's about having your reasons connected up to your actions in the right way. Mm. So acting because you want to do a thing, having your desire to do a thing be the cause of you do it, rather than your jailer ordering you to do a thing being the cause of you doing it mm -hmm. like what the actual causes of your actions are is the arbiter of whether you have free will or not this is the kind of compatibilist position um it has a a long history and um i don't think the many worlds approach uh makes it either 
easier or harder to accept. I mean, one curious thing about the, 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 the view I have is that determinism is necessarily impossible. I mean, it, it cannot, it, look, there are no worlds that, de- that are deterministic. Maybe the totality of everything evolves in a deterministic way, but our world is essentially unpredictable. The one we live in, you look at the, the state of the, the whole of this world right now, you still can't predict the future. Even mm. if you look at the whole state of all the worlds taken together, you can predict the future of all the worlds. If you look at ours, you can't predict the future of it. So there's a kind of effective, in principle, unpredictability, even if when you zoom out and look at the big picture, everything is determined, everything is predictable. Mm. So actually on this view, indeterminism, in the sense of the past of our world not fixing the future of our world, is actually a necessary truth. So determinism, in the sense that the this part of our world fixes the future of our world, is... Um, is necessarily false. And I think that actually maybe does have some effect on the free will debate. But if anything, it makes it slightly easier to make sense of uh, uh, freedom. Though I don't really want to put any weight on that. Um, I just don't think it's any harder. There is a kind of a, a, a common and I think philosophically deep and interesting response to the, the picture I, I put forward, which is to say, isn't it terribly depressing? if the totality of everything is completely the, is completely independent of what we do, nothing we do will affect what the totality of all the world is like. At most, we can uh, determine which world we're in by our actions, or like mm. we can be the causes of future events. We can cause them to happen one way or the other uh, by kind of taking actions which mean it's more probable that we'll be in a world of one kind than a world of another kind. What we can't do is shape the totality of everything. That much is completely independent of us. Mm. And some people don't like that. They think that if the totality of everything is the same, whatever we do, then there's no point doing anything. And I I wouldn't buy that. I wonder if people have this inherent almost um, empathy for the other worlds where they they don't like the zero-sum competition of it, where you know, someone, someone's going to be unhappy uh, about their, yeah. you know, job situation or something. And if I'm not, that means that I've forced someone else to be. Um, yeah. I, I wonder if that's almost driving it. Uh, well, one thing you can do, um, kind of insofar as you can kind of make sense of uh, free action at all um, in this compatibilist way, what you're effectively doing is determining the probabilities over these different outcomes. So you can make sure that the weight, the quantum amplitude associated with the worlds in which things go well for you and people like you is a higher probability. You can kind of shift the chance, the chances in your favor. Mm. That's the the way to kind of think about it under the compatibilist um, freedom way of thinking. And so there's a certain amount of empathy that you still have um, for the, the people around you. You kind of want as high a proportion of them by quantum amplitude as possible to do well. Maybe ultimately that's for selfish reasons, because that's the best way of ensuring that you yourself will do well. <laughs> but I mean, ultimately, um, our moral intuitions uh evolved under the conviction that this was the only world there was Mm. and so when we kind of form the moral view that things matter as long as they're real no matter how far away they are or which world they're in um we've got reason to think that we might be wrong about that because we evolved the situation where everything that we ever encountered or even thought about was was actual once you once you really internalize the thought that these other worlds are alternative possibilities for us they're real but because we're not in those worlds they correspond to alternative possibilities for us that's kind of their role they're Mm. in relative to us it's not so strange i think to think that we don't care about 
mere alternative possibilities. Sure, they're real, but they're also non-actual. And so I argue in the book that it's reasonable to limit our concern to actual things. The actual world is still pretty big. There's still a lot to care about in it. And I think in a certain sense, it doesn't even make sense to care about things in other worlds because they're causally isolated from us. Nothing we can do um, causally affects them. Mm. Um, And that's to come back to a point I I was making earlier. Uh, Causation only operates within worlds. So even if there's a sense in which by making things go well for us, we do consign some other people to have things go badly for them. Uh, We're not causing those people to have things go badly for them. The only causes of things going badly for them were in their own world. So nothing we can do causally affects the other worlds, even if in a certain sense, what happens in that world is explained by what happens in ours. That's not a kind of causal explanation. And this this distinction between causal and non-causal explanation is one of the kind of subtlest um bits of the book and actually it's uh something i'm working on now in my in my next project uh how to distinguish the different kinds of explanation and how to properly account for the relation of causal to non-causal explanation uh but that that would probably take us too far afield (laughs) yeah the so the one thing um because you've been super generous with your time um but but the one thing that i i wanted to ensure i didn't um allow you to escape without without going over was this um this this uh project you have in chapter four of um reconciling the humian and anti-humian viewpoints um in a previously unanticipated way and i'm i'm wondering is that referencing his views on causality yeah so this is this is a uh long-standing debate in uh philosophy of science especially in the metaphysics of laws of nature. So philosophers of science have spent a long time wondering why it is that some truths about the world seem to have this special status um, that make them laws, scientific laws, Mm. Um, that in some sense they're harder to break than things that aren't laws, mere coincidences, mere accidents, as they're sometimes called. Mm. So there's this kind of challenge. What is it that makes something a law? And there are these um, two competing sorts of view about that, the Humean and anti-Humean picture. And the Humean, the Humean view of laws basically says laws are the important regularities. And they're the things that just, in fact, hold true everywhere you go. And they're the kind of useful ones for us to think about. Mm-hmm. So they're just patterns. Mm. They're just patterns in the fact. They're not, there's nothing more, more to it than that. There's no explanation for why those patterns are there. They just are. Hmm. And the anti-Humeans aren't satisfied with that. They think, well, you know, kind of our world is incredibly ordered and structured. It can't just be a coincidence that um, there are these patterns that kind of hold always and everywhere. There's got to be something that explains why these patterns hold always and everywhere. There's got to be something that makes things happen the way they do. And so they posit kind of real ingredients of reality, laws, <coughs> to make things happen the way they do. And maybe one of the most prominent anti-Humeans these days is Tim Maudlin. Um, he's a philosopher of physics that, um, uh, that pushes this line. That the laws have to explain why the world is regular. And so they have to be different from the mere regularities if they're going to explain the regularities. Mm-hmm. So this, this kind of debate has kind of reached an impasse because there seem to be kind of good reasons in favor of both views. The, anti- the, the Humeans say kind of all we ever ex- experience is regularity. This is going, to, going back to Hume's original arguments against causation. We never see causation. We never see laws. All we see are uh, regularities in the phenomena. Um, and so we don't need anything more than regularities in the phenomena in our theory. Um, so they kind of face a deep challenge of kind of explaining why there are so many regularities, or so I think. Mm. Um, but the anti humeans also have this challenge to uh, give an account of how it is that these things, laws, these kind of things, special purpose things that they've introduced to explain the regularities, how they manage to do that explaining. Like, what, what gives them that power? 
Don't the Humeans say there must be something that explains why the world is regular? And the Humeans say, how could anything explain why the world is regular? How could it do that? So we kind of, we kind of reach a, a dead end in that debate. So what I want to say in the book is that Humeans are right from one perspective and anti-Humeans are right from another perspective. So when you zoom out and you look at the whole of reality, you look at all the worlds, you take them together, all there is there at the level of like the universal quantum state is just the facts um, kind of spread out in physical reality. And nothing makes physical reality be the way that it is. It just is that way. Mm. And it couldn't have been any different. So at the fundamental level, the Himians are right. There's nothing yeah. in reality, modal reality, the space of all the possibilities be the way that it is. It just is that way. But when you look in at, at our world in particular, the anti Himians are right, because there is something beyond the actual world that explains why the world is as it is. Uh, the whole global quantum state, including all the other worlds, the whole jigsaw. So... <clears throat> uh, on the picture that I defend in the book, um, the laws are regularities that hold across actual and possible worlds. So it's not just like the Humeans say, mm. um, the laws are regularities that hold everywhere in our world. For me, the laws are regularities that hold everywhere in all the worlds. And that mm. makes it the case that those laws must be obeyed. It's like whatever possibility you're in, the law is obeyed. Whereas the Humean normally just says, uh, uh, in this world, the law is obeyed. Mm, so mm. This picture kind of gives the laws modal force because they're not just about the actual world. They, uh, they say what happened in the actual world, but they say what happened in the actual world in a way that draws on the, all of the others. And so in that way, they're, they're saying what must happen, not just what does happen. Mm. Um, so... This is the kind of thing that is uh, only going to be exciting for you if you've kind of in already got excited about the debate between Humeans and anti Humeans. And it's going to be especially yeah. exciting if you kind of concluded that that debate is stalled and it's a dead end and it's not going anywhere. Because it's a kind of way of rebooting that debate. Um, it's a way of saying there's a kind of middle ground here that Humeans are right about fundamental reality, the anti Humeans are right about the world that we're in. Mm. And so it's a way of kind of giving them each uh, a bit of what they wanted. And I think it's a nice middle, middle, middle ground. No doubt they'll both hate it, but uh, <laughs> at least I tried. Yeah, no, I, that is deeply fascinating to me. Um, and I guess <laughs> while there is some chance that um, there is a world where the rest of this book is awful, I don't think we're in that world. Um, and I, I very much look forward to, uh, to reading the rest of it. Um, okay. So... Yeah, so Alistair, thank you so much. Um, you've been super generous with your time, and this was um, a huge, no nothing short of um, an education for me in this topic. Um, so thank you so much for this. Oh, I, I really enjoyed it too, so thank you. Before we go, um, tell people where they can find out more about you and uh, your work in this book in particular. Sure. Uh, so um, I have a website, uh, alistairwilson.org, uh, which has all my papers and uh, links, links to the book. The book is available now on Amazon. You can buy it from the publisher, Oxford University Press. Um, the other thing that I'm doing at the moment is a project called Frame Phys, so a framework for metaphysical explanation in physics. And that is a project funded by the EU. Uh, and I've got some great people on the team uh, at Birmingham, uh, Mike Hicks, Katie Robertson, Noelia Aranza Ribeiro, philosophers of science, philosophers of physics, um, trying to work out how the different ways in which physical explanations work. Mm. Uh, and one part of this book, um, I've already touched on the distinction between causal explanations and non-causal explanations, the way in which the surrounding worlds explain our world, like a jigsaw uh, explains an individual piece. Um, uh, but there's also explanations in terms of anthropic reasoning so we see a life-supporting universe because a life-supporting un uh, universe that doesn't support life wouldn't have anyone in there to look so those sorts of explanations they're physics explanations it seems but they're not like other explanations in physics so mm. this project is is that's going now is exploring all the different ways in which physics can explain things and that has its own uh, website framephys.org uh, 
Um, and we have a Twitter account. So you can follow me on Twitter, uh, Modalizing. You can follow FrameFizz on Twitter, FrameFizz. Um, and yeah, you can hear more about the book that way. Excellent. All right. Um, well, thank you, Alistair. And uh, to our listeners, I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. And uh, thank you for listening and tune in next time. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode and learned something from it. And if you want to support my work and what I'm doing, you can do so by supporting me on Patreon. You can go um, to patreon.com forward slash Jordan Myers and donate um, on a monthly basis and receive rewards for your donation. Um, again, that's J-O-R-D-A-N-M-Y-E-R-S. And uh, the links will to everything will be in the description below. If you can't monetarily support me, you can support me in other ways by liking this video, uh, commenting on it below, reviewing the show on iTunes, or sharing it with a friend or with your Twitter followers. Um, you can also email me at Plato's Cave Podcast at gmail.com and follow me on Twitter at Jordan underscore C underscore Myers. And if you want, um, you can check out my other show called That's BS. Um, it's a more discussion-based show with me and friends. Uh, I mentioned it at the top of this episode. So um, if you enjoyed this, please consider supporting me on Patreon. And as always, thanks for listening.